Hello everyone and welcome back to another video on the channel. Today we are going to be talking about the best movies of 2021. And when I say best, I mean my favorite movies of 2021 because everybody's going to have their own unique and personal list, which I implore you guys to comment down in the comment section down below. What's your top 10 movies of the year list is? I'm going to be doing a top 15 movies of the year because I thought 2021 was a pretty solid year and I'm cheating a little bit in this list because it's my personal list. I can do whatever I want. So let's just jump right into this with a few honorable mentions. I do want to mention Ryan the Last Dragon, No Time to Die, don't Look Up, Encanto, and Dune. None of those movies are going to make my top 15 movies of the year, unfortunately, but I did want to mention them because I love each and every one of those movies. But let's just jump right into this because I got 15 movies to breeze through, so let's just start with number 15. Zack Snyder's Justice League, how great is it that we actually got to see this four hour cut of this insanely long and insanely long awaited movie from Zack Snyder because the whole Justice League situation was a complete disaster and a mess and for us to even get this movie is a miracle in and of itself but the other miracle is the fact that it's actually kind of amazing this movie is phenomenal in so many ways I do think that there is a three hour cut of this movie that's perfect but you know when you get a, a situation like Zack Snyder did where he was you know where he left the project and he came back to it and you know so many years later and put together this thing and he's able to reshoot some more footage and to just put in literally every idea that he had for a Justice League movie into this film when you have the opportunity to put everything in there just put everything in there leave nothing on the cutting room floor and just have your four hour epic that you promised the fans and I do think this movie has some of my favorite moments in cinema in general this year with especially the flash moments at the end of the film I thought was brilliant there's so many moments in this film that are just so much better than the Justice League that we got in 2017 and just the fact that this movie came out this year like I said is a reason why it's on this list at number 14 is a little known movie starring Rebecca Hall called The Night House and if you guys know me you know that I love horror movies and this is probably the best made horror movie all year. This movie was incredible from beginning to end. It's a very unique story. I have a review up for this one as, uh, as well as uh, pretty much every movie that I'm talking about on this list. I have a review up for it in some way and I just really love this movie. It was very unique and it was very stylistic and it had a lot of great horror moments and it was just an incredible performance by Rebecca Hall alone that was worthy of you know being nominated but of course she's not going to be nominated because it's a horror movie but there's so many unique things that this movie does that is different than a lot of other horror movies and the director of this I believe he also did The Ritual. This is definitely my favorite movie of his so far and definitely has, you know, stated himself as a horror director to look out for, you know, just with these first two films of his. Next up is The Mitchells vs. The Machines and I kind of bounced back and forth of which animated movie I liked most this year and for a long time it was Ryan the Last Dragon, even after The Mitchells vs. The Machines came out and The Mitchells vs. The Machines was just really the biggest surprise of the year for me because this is a movie where when I watched the trailer back in like 2019 or whenever that trailer first came out, I think it was called Connected at first. I thought it looked terrible. I thought this movie looked awful and the fact that it came out and it's you know the same creative team behind Into the Spider-Verse and he had this really unique and colorful and just funny blast of just entertainment of a movie in, in, in an animated fashion. This movie has everything for YouTube and internet fans especially the early 2000s YouTube and early you know YouTube's you know internet culture and all these different references that this movie has there every frame of this movie is filled with different little easter eggs and different little just surprises you can go frame by frame of this film and sketch something new every single time and it's just such a Last. It's one of the most rewatchable movies of the year and the, the pug in this movie, the little dog, and that joke with the dog and the loaf of bread is one of the funniest jokes I've heard in any movie all year. Next up is King Richard, which is probably my favorite Will Smith performance that I've seen from him in a very, very long time. One that I'm hoping that he has a chance to win the Best Actor Oscar for. This is just a very heartwarming family story about, you know, Venus and Serena Williams and about, you know, their family in general and how they got to the point that they got to. And it's a true story that I did not know before I I watched the film and it was just a very inspiring story and when you have an inspiring story in a biopic towards Oscar seasons of course you're going to think that's going to go certain ways and yes this movie does go the typical way of a biopic but it's just such a feel-good story with such great performances from everybody involved Will Smith John Bernthal the two kid actresses who played Venus and Serena and then the mom everybody in this film is at the top of their game and it was just one of the most enjoyable Oscar-y type movies of the entire year. And at number 11, which barely missed out on my top 10, was Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. In terms of MCU movies, in terms of like the new breed of MCU, this one was definitely my favorite. You know, Eternals was hit or miss, you know, Black Panther was, you know, part of the old wave, and then we got Shang-Chi, which is a very stylistic, you know, very, you know, encultured in the, the Kung Fu movies, and it just is very well directed by Destin Daniel Cretton, and I just really loved the direction of this movie. And Simu Liu as Shang-Chi was 
just such a great find. He is so great in the action sequences. He's funny, and just as a person, he seems like a great guy, especially in the behind-the-scenes documentary of this movie on Disney+. Plus. This has one of the, the best, you know, action scenes in any MCU movie. It is just incredibly entertaining from beginning to end. The chemistry between Simu Liu and Aquafina is off the charts, and of course, Tony Leung as the Mandarin in this movie is one of the best Marvel villains that we've had in a while. I loved this film, and it wasn't my favorite comic book movie of the year, but it was definitely one that I was just so happy was great. And Shang-Chi was my number 10 for a while until I decided to rewatch The Harder They Fall. That's right, this is gonna be my number 10 on this list. And if you guys have not seen this movie, I highly recommend you guys check this out. I literally just watched it earlier today just to make sure I, of the placement of where I wanted to put this movie. And just this is one of the most stylistically fun and entertaining westerns that I've ever seen. It's probably my favorite western as of right now. I kind of need to, you know, look back at a list of, you know, a bunch of westerns. But right now, I love this film. Jonathan Majors, Idris Elba, Regina King, so many great actors in this film. I talked about it in my last video. But there's so much for me to rave about. The soundtrack, the style, the direction of this movie is so entertaining and witty. There's so many great laughs in this moment, so many great shots and cinematography, you know, moments of, you know, the camera flying through the glass over to Jonathan Majors sitting on a horse across the entire, like, standoff of this, in this town. It is so well directed. I cannot recommend this movie enough for you guys. If you're not a fan of westerns, trust me, this is a very different type of western. It's very stylistically different from everything that you've seen. Even if the story kind of follows some of the similar beats of other westerns, the ending with the character of Jonathan Majors and the confrontation with Idris Elba is one of the best final act climaxes of the entire year. I loved this movie. At number 9 is Last Night in Soho. I'm a big Edgar Wright fan, and yes, this isn't the greatest Edgar Wright movie of all time, but this is the first time he's made something that was a direct comedy, and this is a movie that is so stylistically Edgar Wright while being something different from him. It's a horror thriller mystery movie that unravels in such a fascinating way, and Ani Taylor-Joy and Thomas McKenzie are phenomenal in this movie. Even Matt Smith as this creepy guy, and the, kind of the antagonist of the movie, or what you think is the antagonist of the movie, is very, very strong throughout this entire mystery. I love how this film kind of unravels in the mystery and the style, especially the cinematography and the magic camera work that Edgar Wright has with the dance scene in the middle of this movie is so, so well done. It just makes me want more of this type of movie from Edgar Wright, and I really hope that he dives more into different genres of movies. He's a great director. We all know that. He can do comedy. He can do action, but now we know he can do an actual horror thriller with some, you know, great funny moments in this movie as well. But like I said, Anya Taylor-Joy and Thomas McKenzie incredible. At number eight is the movie right here, The Suicide Squad. If you guys know me, you know I love wacky, weird movies, and you know I love James Gunn, and of course, when you give him a DC comic book property, of course it's going to be amazing. I hated Suicide Squad in 2016, and this is just the polar opposite. It's a super fun, entertaining, and just really unique movie that goes in directions that you wouldn't expect a movie like this to go. It's very violent and dark, and it's consistently funny throughout the entire film. This is my type of humor. When there's a giant starfish destroying the city, and you have all these random collection of characters, including Polka Dot Man and Rat Catcher 2 going up against this thing. It's insane. This movie is so over the top, but it totally works perfectly with this film, and it gets me excited for things that James Gunn is going to do in the future of DC with the Peacemaker show that's coming out in just a couple weeks, because the Peacemaker was an interesting character in this movie. Everybody was an interesting character in this movie. The Harley Quinn scene is my favorite Har Harley Quinn scene to date. If I stack this movie up against all the other DC movies, maybe even Justice League or Zack Snyder's Justice League, these are probably two of my favorite DC movies in the DCEU thus far. These movies are great. I really do love this movie, and it's just the type of weird that I enjoy in my comic book movies. Clocking in at number seven is Tick Tick Boom, starring Andrew Garfield. This movie was just a blast for me. This is a movie that I wasn't expecting to love as much as I did, but I've seen this movie twice now ever since it came out, and I've just been obsessed with the music in this film. Andrew Garfield is by far my favorite performance throughout this entire year, besides maybe one performance that I'll get to later on, but he's definitely the shoe in for best actor for me. If I were to give out the awards, especially with his performance in some other movies that may or may not be on this list, I just love Andrew Garfield in this film. I really think he deserves the best actor Oscar for this movie. He can sing, he can do all the choreography and the dancing, and he's just so talented in this film, and he really shows all his range in everything that he's ever done, especially this year, but in Tick Tick Boom specifically, he is phenomenal. But besides that, this is Lin-Manuel Miranda's directorial debut, and he crushed it with the style and the entertainment value of this film, and the pacing, and the music, and everything about this film just works 
perfectly with each other. And there's so many emotional moments in this movie. There's so much comedy in this movie. There's so many, so many great songs in this film that you can put on repeat and just be obsessed with for so long. This is the type of musical that I love. And there are a lot of great musicals this year. In the Heights, Encanto, uh, West Side Story, but this one by far is my favorite. And it really was an interesting introduction for me to Jonathan Larson as a person because this is based on a true story and it just gets me excited to dive into more of the things that he did. At number six is a movie that I guarantee you none of you guys have seen. It is called Censor. It came out in Sundance and when I watched it earlier, I think January, February of this year, and I'm excited to see more Sundance movies later in January because I'm going to be doing this again. But Censor was a movie that stuck with me ever since the very beginning of the year. It's one of the first movies I saw and it's now on Hulu and I decided to watch it again just to make sure that I loved it as much as I did and watching it the second time especially the ending of this film and what this film is trying to say this movie is incredible it's about a film censor who essentially you know watches these very violent and gory movies and tries to decide whether or not you know they should release it you know she's a censor she will censor a movie if she thinks it's too violent but she sees something in a film that reminds her of her past with her sister who went missing and she starts to you know, unravel this mystery of what happened with her sister and if it has any connection to this movie and to the filmmaker who made it. And so this movie is one of the most unique films I've seen all year. It is stylistically amazing. Prano Bailey Bond was the director of this film and she is a phenomenal director. I cannot wait to see what she does next because with this film, I'm very excited to see her career in the future. Okay, we've reached the top five movies of this year on my list, starting with Coda. This is a movie that also released during Sundance, but I was not able to see it then. So I watched it with everybody else in August, and I immediately fell in love with this movie, and I immediately knew why this movie won so many awards at Sundance. This is just such a feel-good story about this family, you know, this the only hearing child in a family of deaf, you know, a deaf family, and so it's a very heartwarming story. It, you know, brought me to tears at the end of it with the beautiful singing at the end of this movie and just it's such a feel-good story if you want to watch a movie and just feel so like good about life and about you know this inspirational story of this girl who just wanted to be a singer even though her family will never be able to hear her sing it's such a beautiful story and it's just it's a little you know cliched in terms of you know how it follows a basic story structure but it does it so well that it doesn't matter if you've seen a story similar to this before because it is just so heartwarming and funny this is one of the funniest movies of the year by far. Okay, and I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I was going to cheat a little bit in this list. And so number four is definitely cheating, but I don't care. It's my list. It is the Fear Street Trilogy. That's right. All three of those movies are just so perfectly together. You know, I just kind of see it as one experience. And I got a chance to actually watch this in theaters because, you know, I work at a theater and I was able to, you know, project it up on the big screen. And I love this trilogy. Like I said, I'm a big fan of horror movies, and this is a really fun horror series that has some comedy, that has, you know, a lot of fun directions that it goes. And I think anybody who has not seen the Fear Street trilogy yet, get through the first one, because I think the first one is good, especially in hindsight of the, you know, looking back at the series as a whole, you know, it's not as good as the other two films, but it is, you know, a decent beginning, but trust me, stick with the second and especially the third one. I think the second one is my favorite of the trilogy, but this horror story wraps up in such a beautiful way. And there's such great characterization with all the characters in this series, especially in the second one, the story between these two sisters that I just really, really loved and connected to. And so there's so many things in this film that is just so great to watch. And it's just one of the most entertaining series of the entire year. I really, really did love all three Fear Street movies. Okay, top three. Number three is Spencer. And like I said earlier when I mentioned, you know, the Andrew Garfield performance, Kristen Stewart in Spencer is my favorite performance of the year. This is a biopic that is unlike every other biopic that came out this year because it's a very unique character study. It's not just, you know, a story about Princess Diana like, you know, people would expect this movie to be because it is about Princess Diana and Kristen Stewart does a great job portraying her on the big screen, but it's different because it takes place in three days. You know, it's it's Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and Boxing Day. It just takes place between those three days and it's a very intimate story of who she was, not to the public eye, but who she was behind closed doors. And I, that's what I thought was brilliant about this movie. It's a very slow and quiet film, but it really does dive into who she was and not the things that she did, you know, in her lavish lifestyle of being a princess, but rather, you know, her struggle with being a princess and the struggle of her mental health and different things with her family and all these different, you know, storylines in this film being a very quiet and beautiful film. The cinematography is gorgeous and the soundtrack, the musical score of this movie is definitely one of my favorites of the entire year. This is a movie that just really blew me away and it was my favorite movie of the year when it came out, but it was kind of pushed out by two other films. And one of those two films being my number two movie of the year is also a cheat because I think some people don't consider it to be a movie. 
but I'm going to consider it to be a movie. That is Bo Burnham's Inside. This is a film that is just, when it came out, when I first watched it, I watched it I think three times when I first watched it in the same day. I loved this film and the cinematography alone in this film with Bo Burnham just sitting in a room with a camera and a couple of lights is so beautiful. This movie is gorgeously shot and the music is so unique and funny and th there is so many lyrics and this wasn't originally on my top 15 list. I had to bump out I think Ryan the Last Dragon in order to include this one because I don't know I just I love this film so much. There are so many songs that stand up but Welcome to the Internet is the perfect encapsulation of why I love you know, this this entire film, this entire collection of songs, because there's so many, you know, struggling moments of an artist that he, you know, portrays throughout the entire film, but then he has really funny and just over-the-top ridiculous songs like Welcome to the Internet that just, you know, draws you in and just has you dying laughing. I also really love the lyrics in comedy, and especially the lyrics in Goodbye. I love the song Goodbye, and also All Eyes on Me. There are so many songs. I think of all music that came out this year, I listened to the soundtrack of Inside the most throughout the entire year. But like I said, it's not just, you know, a collection of songs. Bo Burnham is not just a normal comedian. He makes comedic songs, yes, but there's a story within this film of somebody kind of going mad in quarantine, trying and struggling to make this, you know, project of his all on his own. And by the time you get to the end of it, how long it took him to make this thing, how much longer he was expecting this to take versus how long it actually took, is just such a, an interesting story from a struggling artist perspective because I want to be a film student. I, I am a film student. I want to be a filmmaker. And this is just a film that really does capture the struggle of an artist so beautifully. I love Bo Burnham, and this is definitely my favorite thing that he has ever done. And of course, at my number one, I had to put it here because what else could I put at my number one besides Spider-Man No Way Home? I love this movie, and it may not be the greatest Spider-Man movie of all time, but this was an event. I had not had a theater experience like this since The Force Awakens. I actually thought my audience that I watched this with opening night was greater and more loud and more excited than the Endgame audience and the Infinity War audience. We were losing our minds. There's so many great surprises in this movie. And like I said, you know, spoilers from before, but Andrew Garfield, like, come on, he stole this film, but all three Spider-Man all together, which is such an amazing thing to watch on screen. And I watched it so many times in theaters. Me working at a theater, I peek in the theater every once in a while. I watched so many different audience reactions. I love the experience of this movie, but besides that, it is actually a really, really well put together film with a lot of emotional moments and a journey for Peter Parker that I think is very special. Out of all movies that came out this year, I had not been more excited to be in a theater watching it on the big screen in IMAX or Dolby, you know, staring at this massive, you know, film, event film of a movie and going through all these emotional moments, hearing people sob in the theater, hearing people laugh and hearing people scream at the surprises in this film. Like I said, the theatrical experience alone is the reason why this has to be my number one movie of the year. There's nothing else like it that came out in the past. Like ten, like I said, ever since Force Awakens, there's nothing else like it. So that is my top 15 movies of the year. I'm very curious to hear what you guys think of my list and what you guys' personal lists are. Everybody's going to have different thoughts. I also didn't get to see everything. I never got to watch Licorice Pizza or The Tragedy of Macbeth or a few others that I really wanted to watch, but I am very happy with the 79 or 80 movies that I watched this year. I am very happy with this list, and I'm very excited to start reviewing movies for next year. Like I said, Sundance is right around the corner, so I'll have a bunch of reviews out for a bunch of Sundance movies. I just looked through the list, and there's some great ones with you know, a directorial debut by Jesse Eisberg that I'm going to try to see that one and a few others that I'm very excited to watch. So definitely subscribe to the channel if you want to see more reviews, just like this one, other list, other rankings. What do you want me to rank and talk about? I'll happily do that as well. Leave suggestions for what you want in the new year. Thank Thank you guys for subscribing to the channel and just you know, going through this year with me. This is definitely the biggest year of growth I've had on the channel. So thank you guys for enjoying my videos and watching my videos and just interacting too. So that'll be it for 2021. Thanks everybody for watching this video and I hope to see you all next year. Mm -hmm.